Welcome to Beer Buzz. I'm Liz, this is Brian, and today we're drinking with Matt Van Wyck from Ale Song. <laughs> so when did you decide you actually wanted to start your own brewery? Because we first met when you were um, brewing at Oakshire. Yep. How long were you there? and? When did you decide you wanted to start your own? Well, I've been brewing now for 16 years, and I spent um, six and a half years at Oakshire. Um, started with them in 2006. And to answer your question, when did I decide that I really wanted to own my own business? The answer was really never, uh, and I still don't know if I do. Um, I do. Um, but I had a very good role at Oakshire and many of the other breweries I've worked at. And I have, in my career, watched people um, who are the owners of companies and it's very hard and it's stressful and it's, it's, it's time consuming and I've seen relationships break up over not only brewery, breweries but all businesses so because I had a good job um, I was I was the creative I had a creative role at, at Oakshire which I really enjoyed I figured I would never I would never take that jump and become a brewer um, and then I did or become a business owner and then I did and what were the first you know, just to walk me through your first year. I left Oakshire in the fall of 2015. Um, and my two business partners, uh, Brian and Doug, were already kind of working full time on the business. I left Oakshire and, and started in with them. Um, but because we have a brewery that's focused on barrel aging, most of the time when you start a brewery, you have three weeks from when you start brewing and you have something to sell. And when you have to age in barrels, you don't have that luxury. So we knew we had to first get the brewery up and running, get legal with the TTB, and then wait for some barrels to mature. So the timeline looks like this. Um, we were legal to brew March 1st of 2016. So we're not even a year into a uh, legal brewery. Yet. Actually, we're just over a year um, from being legal. Uh, we brewed our first batch March 11th of 16. Sold our first um, keg of beer June 1st. Our first bottles August 20th. Um, and here we are in the beginning of 2017. So we're just a year old and um, just getting rolling, I guess. Just getting rolling, but winning gold at GABF your yeah, first year, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, you guys were like the breakout kids. Yeah. It was really extraordinary to watch. And having known you and seen you know, your path and how you guys have evolved, and uh, it was just such an extraordinary um, win. And that's definitely one of the reasons why I wanted to um, have you on the show and just hear about how that you know, exhilaration um, and, and that uh, instant sort of um, recognition and payoff felt. Yeah. It was it was crazy. The, the the beer we won gold with was called is called Touch of Brett, and it's a Brett saison aged in Pinot barrels. Um, it was the fourth batch of beer we brewed. Um, wow, and we that's were, amazing. Yeah, it is. We were just you know six months into not even six months into our our company, um, and we were fortunate enough to win gold. But you know, like I said, I've been brewing for a while. I've got two talented partners. Um, and so I think we had a head start on some breweries. You know, if you were doing this and you just started from scratch, maybe you were home brewing or, or maybe you had one assistant brewer job and you jumped into this, it would be even more challenging. But we had some, some uh, experience behind us, which helped. Um, but it was pretty amazing. Um, because I've been to GABF, the Great American Beer Fest, since 2016, or since 2005, um, I realized that it's really hard, really hard to win awards, especially because there's now 7,500 beers that are judged. So mm -hmm. winning is, is, is awesome. One of the things I found really interesting when I heard that you were starting Ale Song was that it was, you know, you were outsourcing, you know, the, the war. Um, and working with uh, Nick over at Block 15, yep. and then you were doing just bar uh, barrel aging and blending um, on your premises. The way we do it at, at Ale Song is unique, and I've never done it like that at another brewery. So we didn't buy a brew house. Um, we just have um, fermenters and a bright tank and a bunch of, of oak barrels. Um, and what we do basically is rent a brew house. Um, we go up to Block 15 and um, it's on a day they're not brewing and we get to use their brew house and make the wort. So I take up the grain, I take up the hops. Uh, we just use their system and, and power and, and water. And we go through the heat exchanger, knock out into uh, totes, put them on our truck and head down to Eugene. 
Uh, we ferment in our tanks and our brewery as well as age in the barrels and then we bring it back to a blending tank where we uh, do the packaging. And so everything is done in-house except for that wort making which is done at Block 15. So would you say that's a pretty unusual and unique model? It is. Um, uh, certainly we didn't invent it. We stole it from friends. You know, beg, borrow, and steal and, yeah. and, and do whatever you can to get by. Um, we have great friends in Colorado who are doing it. I know there's some breweries in California doing it. Um, and what you realize is a lot of people have excess capacity where no one, not many breweries except for the bigger guys, are brewing every day of the week. So even if you have a Saturday open or a Sunday open, um, the host brewer might as well make some rent money off of their system. Um, so it's a unique way, and what the greatest part is, we didn't have to drop up to two hundred thousand dollars in capital s startup, and so I can pay myself a little bit because of that, uh, not needing to have that big capital investment. Yeah, it's also a great way for all those brewers out there to, you know, make some money um, on their initial investment because they're not using it all there's, the time. There's nothing worse than win, buying win. that and then watching it sit there. You know, in a brew pub situation, you can sort of. Um, uh, you can use that as marketing, say, look at my shiny tanks and come in and drink beer here. So that's kind of okay. But if you have a production brewery, you need to be using it to make the money on it. Uh, otherwise, you're just not getting your ROI on it. So what was the worst advice and the best advice you were given as you were setting off on your own and starting this business? I've been given a lot of advice. Um, the worst advice probably was, yeah, go ahead, start a brewery. <laughs> I don't remember who said it, but they were idiots. No, that's not true. I'll give you a piece of, of good advice I got, which is kind of stuck with us. Um, and, and it actually became a beer name. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how that links in. Uh, we were starting up the company and we were looking for investors. And um, most of the people that invested in us um, in the beginning were family, friends, some acquaintances in the industry, things like that. And uh, we had one uh, potential investor who was a winery owner in California. And he, one of my two business partners, he, he uh, uh, my business partner used to work with him, for him. And uh, we sat down uh, in his beautiful winery down in, um, in California, in Napa Valley. And he's talking to us about his brewery, or his winery, sorry, and the wine that he makes. And uh, this is one of those wineries where you have to get on a list. You just don't find it wherever. It's, it's pretty high end and it's pretty uh, rare stuff. And uh, he spends the time talking about himself and his winery and how he built his business. And, and we wanted to pitch him our business. We were trying to say, hey, we want to tell you what Ale Song is. Um, and, uh, which, but it was fine. We just listened. You know, when you go asking for investment money to start a business, um, don't speak unless spoken to. <laughs> Wait till the cues. So, so we listened. Also good advice. <laughs> yes, yes. And he told us a lot. And, uh, and he's a great resource for us. Um, because he did the same thing. He started a small company and he's a very successful businessman now. Um, but one thing he said to us was he said, guys, I want to tell you one thing. You're going to have all kinds of barricades in front of you, hurdles, walls. People are going to put walls up in front of you. You got to fucking knock them down, they, he said. He said, you ever seen a rhino suit? And we're like, rhino suit? What do you mean? He goes, have you seen a rhino? Yes, we've seen a rhino. Big horns, big animal. When I get to the point where... I'm getting walls put up in front of me. I'm getting barriers put up in front of me. He said, I put on my rhino suit and knock those damn things down. Just knock them down. <laughs> Cheers to the rhino <laughs> <Yeah>. suit. <laughs> and, and we're sitting there. The three of us are just like, you know, three guys just trying to get some money for start up a business. And yeah, rhino suit. Got it. Okay. Beer, beer name. Beer name. So this says rhino suit right here. We, we made a beer called rhino suit, and this is the mocha version of it. But um, it's an imperial milk stout aged in bourbon barrels. It's big ass beer, 12%. And uh, we knew that rhino suit had to be a name. And it had to be a big ass <laughs> right. pearly beer. Right. So if we were to go to Ale Song, you have a tasting room in uh, just outside of Eugene. So right now we just have 4.5 acres and a half of a building on it. So we currently we started operations in Eugene. We just have a warehouse space. Um, we don't have any open to the customer hours. Uh, well, actually that's not true. Four to six on Thursdays we do do dock sales, um, but we really don't have a, a, a forward-facing pub or tasting room or anything like that. But well, that's because I'm not in town. That's yet. right. That when you come to town, <laughs> it'll be open. Um, we purchased four and a half acres um, right at the southern end of the Willamette Valley AVA. It's right Beautiful. beside King Estates Winery. Um, we, we share a property, property line, actually. And um, 
So when people are out in the country um, checking out the great um, you know, wines that are out there, we're hoping they'll cruise by, by our brewery and, and have some beers. Um, we're building this uh, barrel house and tasting room. Uh, it'll have a huge patio. In fact, it'll be a small tasting room with a, a bigger patio that you can sit outside on picnic tables. Um, we're hoping to have food trucks. We're hoping to provide some cheese and charcuterie. We're hoping to, you can bring food and have a picnic. It's family friendly, dog friendly. Um, we're hoping that we can, um, you know, roam the 4.5 acres. We got a, in the spring, we got a little creek that trickles through. Um, it's a pretty neat place to just relax, enjoy the scenery, and enjoy good beer. So uh, whether or not you had one when you started or maybe where you are now, do you have a philosophy of, of beer, of drinking, of imbibing? Is there something that is like sort of your guiding principle? You know, um, we have kind of a view at, at Ale Song, and, and, and I'll, I'll try to explain this without the, the marketing shtick because, you know, I can, I can make it all verbose, and, but you can go to the website and see that, how we wrote it. But, but we called our company Ale Song um, because not only do we love music and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of guiding in a lot of things we do, but really how, it, how we came on that name was, was because of the blending part of our business, um, we take barrels. We brew a lot of beer and it doesn't become, beer goes in tank, beer comes out of tank, goes into a bottle or a keg, and then you drink it. Um, it's not batch to batch, it's make, make wort, get beer fermented, put it in barrels, and then go try the barrels, then go start blending them together. So what you've got is all these different threads coming together. And, and so many types of art, I think, are this way, where you've got many different pieces coming together. So if you think about an orchestra or a five-piece band or something like that, it's not just a single note. It's not just one person playing a solo or even a duet. You have to have all these things woven together to make something more beautiful than a single thing by itself. And, and so every time that we're trying to blend beers, we're uh, you know, creating a new, new brand, we're thinking about those things and how can we bring more depth, complexity. Um, and the last part of that analogy is, is, this is this is something that's close to us that we are like, I love this, this is beautiful. Um, it's my art, but people can interpret it how they want. Someone can pick this up and say it's shit. You, great, it's art. No, it's not. It tastes like shit. If you don't like sour beers, you might say that. Um, but that's for each person to interpret it. It could be a band that you'd have the same like it or hate it sort of thing. It could be a painting on the wall in the museum, like it or hate it. So, so we think we're creating art and we're trying to do it kind of how a musician might, might come together and compose something richer and more complex than, than something by itself. And, and if we can keep, continue to keep that vibe and that, that um, sort of that, that philosophy as we blend beers together, we think we'll, we'll make some pretty tasty beers. Well, cheers. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Cheers to the rhino suit. I'm taking that one home with me too. <laughs>